Uh, I get the pleasure this morning to introduce uh, Session Zero. Uh, session Zero is something that we started a couple years ago, uh, having a big tent session, bringing a, a presenter to the entire uh, mini bar community uh, and, and organization. And today I'm, I'm excited to be able to welcome Mark McCahill to the stage. Uh, for background, uh, Mark was actually uh, at the University of Minnesota uh, in 1989 for a number of years and worked on uh, some very early software around pop mail. How many people here use pop mail at some point in time? Okay, yep. All over 35, I'm going to guess. <laughs> uh, and uh, how many? And then uh, he also worked on uh, what is widely recognized as the precursor of uh, the modern internet, uh, the Gopher Protocol. And uh, Gopher was uh, created by Mark and uh, others at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and then connected with uh, a number of other folks uh, to uh, create uh, a really great web of information. Um, Mark uh, also has uh, some background at Minibar. Uh, Mark presented at the very first Minibar. So uh, in a way, this is a return visit for him. So uh, 11 years later, welcome Mark McHale to the stage. Hook me up. Okay. Um, so usually I do really technical talks, and this is going to be more philosophical. So it's a little bit of a stretch for me, but I thought. You know, rather than diving into, totally diving into old tech, I'd try to draw some lessons from it that would apply to current things. And so I'm going to trace my journey of uh, in computing in Minnesota and the aesthetics, the what's good, what's bad, why you do things, why you don't do things, because that's some kind of lesson that we could probably apply forever. By the way, I've still got my University of Minnesota email address, one of the shortest ones ever, because I got there early. Um, to get... To give you some context, for some reason, 25 years after we did the Internet Gopher stuff, everyone wants to talk about it. So last fall, <laughs> there's, uh, there was an article in the Chronicle of Higher Ed called What the Internet That Might Have Been. I got my picture on the front page of the Chronicle. That's like being on the front page of the Rolling Stone for Higher Ed, so that's a big deal. But I was having some doubts yesterday, thinking, well, I don't know, this is going to be kind of a stretch for a talk. Can we really apply old lessons? Is there any resonance of the old to the new? And as I was walking to lunch, true story, I look down and I see this. I go, oh my god, does this have any resonance? Does this tell us that things repeat somehow? I don't know. For people of a certain age, probably yes. So let's go back actually to the era of Richard Nixon. I was a uh, student in the Minnetonka West Junior High when Ties, a local organization, decided it would be smart to start seeding the junior highs with computers. And since there wasn't a curriculum forum yet, it was great. This showed up. This is a Teletype 33. Uh, it was state of the art back then, and the great part was they basically a math teacher, science teacher, that said, hey, Mark, this is kind of interesting. You might want to take a look at it. You can play with it after classes. Here's the manual. Go for it. So we did. Uh, you could write programs on this thing. It would print things out on a long scroll of paper. Mostly what we were into was printing math functions out and looking at the pretty patterns we could make, printing and using up lots of paper and computer time. You stored your programs on paper tape. It punched holes, and then you could play the tape back. So you had actually a lot of control. It was interactive. You could store your stuff. You could take your program with you. It wasn't stuck up on a mainframe forever. Sorry, they're having a hard time hearing you. Can you hold it? Yeah. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to do it one-handed. So you could do a lot with this stuff. Classics like this kind of basic program where you'd say, what is your name? What do you want? Do this thing. And then basic which was all we knew about back then, had these go-to statements that would hop you to a different part of the program. And this was the kind of stuff we were doing. After a while, 
um, I went to high school and they had a computer club there again with those teletypes. And we started developing some idea of what's good. What's good was something that was simple and understandable. And I hate to admit that probably one of the earliest instances of griefing with a computer that I'm aware of was me. In the computer club, there was one guy who was writing not that good a program, I thought. He had, in these kind of things, way too many go-tos for my taste. So what did I do? I took one of his programs and then larded it up with about four zillion go-tos. It still worked, but all it did was jump around randomly. And then I saved it in the shared storage space under his initials. <laughs> He swore that he didn't do it, and I said, but man, it's got your, your initials on it. I don't know. <laughs> so even high school students and junior high students had some notion of there's good and bad, do things the right way, simple and understandable is the right thing to do. I ended up going to the University of Minnesota as a chemistry major, um, but also did quite a bit of computing there. Didn't ever finish the last couple classes to get a computer science degree, too. Partly because when I got to the university, this was what I was confronted with, uh, key punch. This was how you were going to write your programs. Punch key, do key punch to get decks of cards that you could hand to a guy who would put it in a card reader, and then 20 to 40 minutes later, if things weren't too backed up, your output would get put in a little bin in the window. So that wasn't so interactive. And what I learned there was that batch processing card decks is really just not a recipe for creativity. Another aesthetic that I picked up, you want fast and interactive. Otherwise, it's very difficult to keep the flow and do anything cool. Happily, these things showed up. And I got, again, unrestricted access to one of these. The reason that I got a bunch of access to an Apple II really early on is the lab that I was working in was doing a bunch of analysis in Fortran on the big computer, on the mainframe, using big decks of cards and burning a lot of compute cycles and a lot of money. And one of the researchers had the vain hope that we could try to move that stuff maybe to an Apple II, good luck on that, and save some money. Well, we couldn't really do that, but we could write some other interesting programs, and so I spent lots and lots and lots of time doing stuff on the Apple II, mostly because it felt good. The development environment was way better than punch cards and handing things to a guy in the I.O. station. I did enough of that that I could get a job as the lowest form of life, a junior application programmer. That's like the entry level guys that they just barely would let touch a computer at the University Computer Center. So I switched from doing chemistry with a lot of computer analysis of results to being one of the computer guys in the microcomputer center or the microcomputer systems group. The mainframe guys had gotten the idea that they'd better do some kind of support for the little computers. And so the sign that I retrieved at one point from when we were moving buildings for our group. One of the things that we picked up there was that there was an aesthetic about what kind of language to use. And I was digging around for stuff to illustrate this talk and found, oh, God, the Terak. No, probably nobody here really used these. If you did, you're really, really old. Teraks were basically PDP-11s repackaged with a graphics thing. The best part of this is down towards the bottom, the second or third paragraph, it says, the Terak was popular for teaching Pascal to college kids. As such, all the oldsters who were in college then and used this computer have a great affection for it, meaning they can no longer remember how slow they were. <laughs> they were also heavy, really heavy. We love these things. Um, and the UCSDP system was this integrated development environment that made it so easy to switch between the editor to the compile link, run it, oh, I broke this, edit compile link, real fast development cycle. So it was the total antithesis of the mainframe batch jobs. This set up a big schism within the computer center about whether Pascal was a better language or Fortran. So there were huge, huge wars about what's the right tool to be using. And all of the little computer radicals like Pascal, because we had great development environments for it. But the big takeaway here is, if you want creativity, unsupervised access to powerful interactive systems, that's where it's at. And one of my things for my whole career is, how can I give that kind of access to lots of people? That's what I always want to do. Well, if you really wanted powerful interactive tools, when the Macintosh showed up, for us, old timers, boy, everything really changed. 
I remember the afternoon the Apple guys brought in one of those to show us, and it was clear they were going to leave it, at least over the weekend, and I was trying to figure out how is it I'm going to make sure I get to have this for the weekend, because I've got to spend some time with this machine and understand it. So I did something that probably wasn't really nice, but I made sure that I got that mouse and put the mouse in my back pocket. <laughs> and I said, you know, you guys, you got the computer and the keyboard, but I don't think you're going to get too far without the mouse. So give it up. That worked. We very much were impressed with the Macintosh, but we we're also working for the computer center, so that meant we had to do things that would work with the mainframe. An esoteric kind of terminal that was out was a Tektronix 4010. Again, you only know about these if you're really, really old. But these things rocked the house for graphics. They could do this. I mean, that doesn't look bad. <laughs> it, nice vector graphics on a scope. Every one of these pictures you'll see always have something at the bottom that says, don't leave the display on for extended periods of time because you'll burn the pattern in. But So our idea was, hey, we could, the Mac can do graphics. Those Tektronix terminals are rare, but they're cool. Let's do a terminal emulation program for the Mac that'll make it act like a Tektronix 4010. Boy, were we smart. We were so sure that we were going to just totally rock the world with this thing. Unfortunately for us, someone else had exactly the same idea and released their stuff before we did. I kind of went, oh, man, but learned an important lesson. When the time is right, stuff's going to happen. Probably stuff's happening in multiple places at the same time, something to deal with. But if you're in that kind of environment, whoever does the better, cleaner one might have an edge. So keep it simple, clean, except that when the time's right, it's going to happen. You probably don't, you're not the only person in the world with this idea. One day, one of my smart friends stopped by with an idea. Uh, my smart friend, Tom Jacobson, is one of the real unsung heroes of the University of Minnesota computing scene, in my opinion. He was kind of a consultant doing a bunch of the networking stuff. And the reason that I think he's an unsung hero, and he stopped by with this big idea, is this showed up in my closet, in the, right next to our desks, and we could, like, do stuff with it. That yellow stuff is thick Ethernet. The first Internet connectivity between buildings at the University of Minnesota was thick Ethernet with these clamp-on transceivers. Uh, that brand, actually, just like that. Why was this a big deal? Because now we could get out reliably to the rest of the net. Big, big, big deal. How did it get there, though? Unauthorized. <laughs> One weekend, Tom said, to a few cohorts, I was not one of them, unfortunately. I wish I could claim this. We're going to break into the steam tunnels. We're going to pull the thick net. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> That's how internet stuff started showing up at, between at least some of the buildings at the university. Why was that the right thing to do? Powerful tools into the hands of people, unsupervised access, so they can figure out what it is they want to do with it. And from that experimentation could, comes good stuff. One of the good things that came from that is we got religion that the internet was a big deal in a big way, and we got the idea that we wanted to do an email system that our receptionists could use so we could get them using email. Because back then, if you're going to do email, it usually meant you needed to be a Unix guy. And our receptionists were not into being Unix people. So we did a simple front end to email uh, back in 89. Last night, I found our announcement for this in the microcomputer newsletter that we used to publish. It talks about, hey, this is really cool. Uh, da, da, da. The top of the second column, most non-technical people are not happy using Unix. And when they do use Unix, they require large amounts of training. So instead, we're making it easy. Again, if you can find ways to make powerful tools acceptable and usable by other people, that's one of the good things to do. Uh, what did it look like? Kind of like this. Uh, bad reproduction because it's like second generation, but actually your email packages today, user interfaces look not unlike this, right? Reply, fetch, send, find, some icons. Uh, we were also having some fun with this since the subject of this was the committee on committees next meeting. There really is or was such a thing. 
so this leads me to when we got into something really big. The um, university got the idea that it needed a campus-wide information system. It wanted to have some way of having a big information system. This is before there was any kind of in World Wide Web or any of that stuff. This was very, very, very early days of the internet. I mean, it was just barely the point where people were reliably sending mail around who weren't Unix people. So what happened? The university did what universities do. It put together a committee to think about this, which was fine. It was a great way to gather requirements and understand what the problem was. Unfortunately, the committee then overstepped its, <laughs> its bounds, perhaps, and decided that at least part of it wanted to tell us exactly how we were supposed to write it. Now, as developers, we weren't too cool with the idea that you're specifying precisely how it is I'm supposed to build this thing, especially because your design is about as elegant as this airplane-like thing is. In other words, there was no way we could see that that would ever work. So we did something kind of dangerous, but in retrospect, the right thing. We kind of ignored what the committee said about the technical stuff, took to heart what they said that they wanted to do, the important parts of it, and designed something that we called Internet Gopher, which I like giving these talks because nobody knows what Gopher is anymore, so it's like the old days for me. I have to explain, what is this thing? You would start up a client, it would go to a Gopher server and get a list of things back. The list of things could be collections of stuff, folders, could be objects like documents, text or PDF or images, could be search engines where you could type in words and it'd go find things. The search engines could do things like look across multiple Gopher servers and find things not just at the server you're running, but at ones other people are running at other places. Sounds almost like something we've heard of. Google, kind of, on a small scale. So a lot of the stuff that we see these days in the web, uh, we did very early on with Gopher because you need them as basic tools for doing some kind of distributed information system. We also, though, worked hard at building a community. One of the things we did is put on some conferences. Part of the reason we did it, frankly, was I wanted t-shirts for my team and I didn't want to have to pay for them. <laughs> so if I would do a conference and we'd charge admission, then we'd have enough money left over that everybody on my team would get t-shirts. And so we had cool t-shirts too, like surf the internet with the internet gopher. That's a gnarly little gopher. Uh, there's one thing I got to show you to give you some sense of where we're coming from, though. So give me a second, because I'll have to scroll through this video. Just a sec. Ah. Okay, I'm to the good part. Um, the guy I'm talking to in this video is Farhad Anklasaria. Farhad is the man. He was the one who came up with most of the important parts of the Gopher protocol. The full text search stuff was my idea. The other stuff, the connect to servers, pull back things, display them, that's Farhad. So about 10 years after we did Gopher, we did a little video of what did we do right, what did we do wrong, and since I'm into learning from my mistakes, what did we do wrong, Farhad? Okay, so Farhad's dissing cyber squatters. Uh, he, he takes it personally because he knew a couple of people who made a lot of money by grabbing domain names and then selling them for a lot of money later. But this raises an interesting point. I bring this one up for a key reason. When we were doing this, commercial stuff wasn't high on our radar. In fact, it wasn't possible for it to be high on our radar because, as we mentioned here, the backbone that was connecting the universities, NSFNet, had a rule that there's no commercial use on the NSFNet. It wasn't until alternative backbones started growing that you could do commercial stuff. Thus, the things you build are a product of the time. If you make it flexible enough, you can dance around the changes, and World Wide Web proved to be quite good at dancing around the changes in the environment 
and being good for commercial stuff, and we weren't as good at it. This leads me to rise and fall of Gopher. Your products will have, or projects, will have a normal life cycle. They will bloom, they might grow. Eventually, though, they might go into decline. For a while, early on, we were doing really well compared to the web, right? If you're looking at the numbers, uh, in 92, uh, just 250 some Gopher servers. By 93, there's about 1,100 of them and maybe 50, maybe 100 web servers. We grew faster than the web early on because we were super easy to set up, had good documentation, and we had intentionally designed everything to be as simple as possible so that it was easy to write clients. Most of the Gopher ecosystem, we didn't write. Other people wrote it because we made it easy to integrate with our tools and had a compelling case that this is a cool kind of thing to do. One story I like to tell about projects is when you feel like you're really rocking it, when you're, I'm just killing it right now, man, I really got things going, be really careful. Why? Because back in the late 92, early 93 time frame, uh, I was at a meeting, an Internet Engineering Task Force meeting with Farhad. We did a presentation on Gopher. It was very well received by some of the gods of the Internet. It was cool. I got to meet some important people like Vince Cerf, uh, John Postel. Tim Berners-Lee was there, and Tim was talking about World Wide Web. And that was cool. I got to meet Tim. I got to see the web before there were any graphics, and it just ran on a next workstation. The last day of the conference, we're sitting in San Diego, sitting around a pool, actually, because that's where the, there was a lunch that you could sit and eat, with Tim. And Tim's saying, guys, you know, I think we're kind of trying to do the same thing at the end of the day. We're trying to do a distributed information system that people could use. I think there's a lot of overlap between our stuff. Why don't we try to like join forces and do this together? And I said, Tim, it's a great idea, but I haven't really looked at your stuff. I, I mean, I don't know enough about how your stuff works. The first time I've seen it was like yesterday. <laughs> Let me go back, read your documentation, think about it, and see how we could work. So we went back to Minnesota, and I spent a couple of weeks looking at Tim's stuff, and went to Farhad one day and said, you know, Farhad, I'm just not feeling it. I just, I don't think this, I don't see how this is going to work. And Farhad said, yeah, I don't think so either. <laughs> that could have been a mistake on my part. <laughs> and it could have been because it's like, well, we're really killing it right now. So uh, an aesthetic thing to think about. <laughs> you may be killing it now. Think about what's coming next. <laughs> so this leads me into big picture. The big takeaways. One thing that I've been understanding for a long time is whenever something seems hard to do, it probably means I'm using the wrong tools. If I'm writing a whole bunch of code, I'm definitely doing it wrong. I should be writing about that much code, or I'm using the wrong tools, or I'm approaching the problem from the wrong viewpoint. Alan Kay, one of the gods of computing, one of his famous sayings is, point of view is worth 50 IQ points. Looking at it the right way makes you look a lot smarter. Using powerful tools makes it, look a lot, makes it easier. Should be relatively easy. What if there aren't any tools? Maybe that's the time to build one that other people can use to make things easier. One of the things that that committee designed for Gopher was the most Baroque thing imaginable in terms of complex and trying to fit shoehorn square pegs into round holes and that kind of thing. Our counter with Internet Gopher protocol was really simple. And we'd argue, and still argue, simple is just fine, as long as you make sure it's extensible. In fact, simple is great because you can understand it, you can explain it, other people can help you. But too simple that can't be extended puts you in a box. So leave room for adding extensions. They'll, if you're successful enough, they'll come. Perhaps the biggest one is community is crucial. I've talked a lot about stuff we did with Gopher. I don't think I said I too often, except for when we screwed up, and those were usually me. Uh, community and your team is vital. So building and nurturing a smart friends network is probably job one. Smart friends network, AKA Tom Jacobson, saying, hey, Mark, you should take a look at this. Mike Carlson, my uh, math teacher in junior high, saying, hey, Mark, you should take a look at this teletype. That's where all of my big edge came from. Having a really great team is also where my edge came from. So work hard on that. That's also why I was at Minibar One. 
I wanted to keep working that smart friends network. What happened after that, though, is I decided it was time to move on and went to uh, Duke University. So I would love, I would continue to be at these things if I were still in Minnesota, but now I'm a Southern guy. So I, my friend that I had dinner with last night was asking me, what the hell is this Minnesota computing aesthetic you're talking about? Can you sum it up? And I said, well, in my mind, it comes down to sort of a do-it-yourself thing. Uh, I used to play a lot of music. When was, we were in college and in high school and junior high, the big thing was, sure, do science and mathy stuff, but we also did music. So the punk, simple, bash it out, you could do it, do it yourself stuff is what it's all about in my book. And if you think about a bunch of where things happened at Minnesota, like that steam tunnel, they broke into the steam tunnel and just strung the cables, that's total DIY punk aesthetic. It's not a bad place to be. Which brings me to my kind of off the wall thing, but I want to point out there are huge parallels here. If you look at the music scene in Minnesota back in the 70s and 80s, there were a couple guys who pioneered the whole thing. Uh, Suicide Commandos were this little three piece that was doing punk rock, new wave stuff before anyone else does or did. They showed the way. Uh, a bunch of bands followed after them because they showed it was possible. The funny part of this is that those guys, I knew them, they were in my high school, two of them, um, a couple years older. This though, again, feels to me like Minnesota computing aesthetic. The scene's not here, that's okay, we'll make our own. And our own will be pretty good. Now the, the joke of this whole thing though is the commandos, did one record and then a live thing, and that was about it, but they've got some new record coming out 39 years late this May. So if you're into that kind of punk rock stuff, you might want to check that out. So, and one of my favorite songs by them is called Complicated Fun. So making powerful tools widely available, good powerful tools that are understandable, that's the best sort of complicated fun. If you do that, you could be part of big hits of Mid-America, Volume 3 or 4. Okay? Uh, oh, man. I finished with three, seconds, three minutes to spare. I'll take a question if there is one. You're going to have to yell. Yes, I'll put my presentation online. Yeah. <laughs> You know, there, the sick part is there are still Gopher servers, and there's a Gopher client for iOS. <laughs> they, they, and they wrote it from scratch in Python, which was actually, that'd be pretty easy. It, they did a nice job, too, strangely enough. I don't remember the, the name of the, the, what the basic program was. Oh yeah, uh, that, that Oregon Trail, I was going to mention that, but forgot. Uh, Oregon Trail from Ties, again, huge Minnesota thing. One of the best programmers I've ever worked with, who couldn't be here today, she's up in Duluth helping her mother, that I still work with, Liz Wendland, uh, used to work at Ties on the Oregon Trail, along with a bunch of other people. Uh, she wasn't in the initial round of people working on Internet Gopher, but we lured her into working at the university on subsequent stuff and a bunch of other projects. I eventually lured her down to Duke to uh, work there. She, though, missed the snow and the winter and the cold and moved back here, but she telecommutes and works at Duke. So Liz and uh, Oregon Trail are a big part of it. And if you ever meet Liz, and want to bother her, just mention something about Oregon Trail and snake bite. She hated snake bites in the Oregon Trail. <laughs> One more. Yeah. Am I still a gopher loyalist? Goldie gopher loyalist. Yeah, I'm still a gopher loyalist. Okay, thanks. Have a great conference.